have been called by God and we've been chosen for this hour. We are no better than anyone else. We're no better than any other denomination except we have been called by his name. Praise the Lord, everybody. It is a high honor, a great privilege to be in this conference and to hear what we've heard and experience what we've experienced already. I am so grateful for the chance just to rub shoulders with the great men and women of God that are in this conference. Some of them are preachers. Some of them are saints of God. And I am so grateful for all of you. And uh, I would like you to just uh, help me with one thing before we get started today. If you would lift your hands one more time, turn your attention completely heavenward for a, just a moment. And just whatever you're feeling in your spirit of gratitude or overflow, thanksgiving, praise, worship, if you would just let that out and let it come out through your vocal cords for a minute. The Bible tells us to lift up our voice in the sanctuary and bless his name. I thank you, Jesus, for the privilege standing on a holy ground among your people, in your presence, and the high honor of being able to open your word today. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done right here in this meeting as it is in heaven. And we will thank you for it. We worship you, Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. And they continued. To continue is to go on or to keep on, to last or to endure, to remain in a particular state or a particular capacity, to remain in place, to abide or to stay, to persist with, to maintain or to retain. And they continued. To continue implies existing uninterruptedly for an appreciable length of time. It implies duration or existence without any break or interruption. It implies persistence against other influences that would tend to weaken or undermine or destroy. To continue implies perseverance in the face of opposition. It implies holding out until a desired end is seen, still fresh, unimpaired, and unexhausted, sometimes under conditions that should have produced the opposite effect. To continue implies constancy without change to an essential state, and they continued. Surely we could have come up with a better theme. Because to the modern mind, that doesn't sound very progressive. That doesn't sound very catchy. And they continued. Surely we could have come up with something a little bit more in tune with the opening years of the 21st century. Because to continue sounds a bit old school. A bit boring, perhaps. A bit out of touch with the ever-shifting trends of our culture. To merely continue certainly doesn't resonate with the Christian conference junkies who spend hundreds of hours and thousands of dollars every year just looking for something new. A new method, a new paradigm, a new revelation, a new approach, a new anything. And so to simply continue doesn't seem to cut it. Or does it? In the New Testament... Continue, the Greek word is uh, proskartero, and pros means toward, and that prefix is used intensively, it's very strong. And kartero means to be strong, and so to continue in your Greek Bible means to be strong towards something. And that's why sometimes, like in the theme scripture for this conference is, they continued steadfastly. The book of Acts, you believe what you want, I believe it is God's blueprint for building his church. I believe that Acts chapter 2 contains the very first New Testament church service. Jesus paid for the church, but he didn't start the church. He left that in the hands of his disciples. And so the book of Acts chapter 2 contains the first New Testament church service. Verse 38, you believe what you want. I think that is the New Testament pattern 
for the obedience to the gospel message, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And you believe what you want, but I believe Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47 is the pattern for New Testament church discipleship. Acts 2.42 says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Verse 46 says, And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. The Christians you meet in the book of Acts were not content to meet once a week for services as usual. The Bible tells me they met daily. They cared daily. They won souls daily. They searched the scriptures daily and as a result they increased in number daily. Their Christian faith was a day to day reality not a once a week routine. Now the Bible tells us that they continued daily. It tells us they did all of this. And then it says, the Lord added to the church daily. If I could pull a principle out of that, I would say this. When we do what we're supposed to do every day, then God will do what He's supposed to do every day. If we don't do what we're supposed to do every day, all bets are off. But if we will do what we're supposed to do every day, then God will do what he said he would do every day. So if you want to catch up with God once a week, and I'm not just hitting on saints right now, if you want to catch up with God once a week when you're getting Sunday's message or your Sunday attendance together, you're going to miss most of what God is doing because God doesn't just rest up for Sundays. God is at work in his church every single day. Day. That's why we need to continue. That's why we need an unbroken chain of apostolic prayer and praise and worship and witnessing. We need all of that from Sunday to Sunday on a continuum right through to the rapture. The Lord added to the church daily precisely because his people did these things daily. They continued, they continued steadfastly in those habits without a break. And every apostolic church in the 21st century has an opportunity to have a revival like they had in the first century. And here's our problem, and I, I will confess today, I'm a little out of my comfort zone because I'm usually coming at this issue from the other side of the coin. But that's not uh, what God's laid on my heart for today. Uh, we're, we're not privileged to enter into that spectrum of revival just because we preach the same doctrine. I love our doctrine because it's not our doctrine. I love our doctrine because it's not our doctrine. It comes from here. It's Bible doctrine. But just because we preach the same doctrine doesn't mean we're going to have the same results because they had not only doctrine, they had what they would call discipleship. They had something that made people into followers of Jesus Christ that didn't just show up on Sunday to taste a sermon and taste a few songs and see if they preferred what happened that Sunday at that church over what they experienced last Sunday at that or some other church. They really had disciples that lived for God every day of the week. So one commitment in one service or at one conference is not going to do it. It has to happen as we adapt our lives to the leading of the Holy Ghost every day. So I guess the best way to summarize this message is to tell you right up front that the principles that we find in the book of Acts will work for everyone. Turn to your neighbor and say, they'll work for everyone. But they won't work for everyone. Turn back to your neighbor and say, but they won't work for everyone. How's that for being clear? There's an eternal principle in Scripture that defines our God. He is no respecter of persons. 
Starts in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. Continues in Second Chronicles when Jehoshaphat is appointing judges. He says in 19 and 7, Wherefore, now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. In the Old Testament, our God is contrasted with earthly kings who could be bribed by your gift, who could be bought off by your money and your influence and your prestige and your power. And some people still try to approach God that way. They try to approach God with their good deeds. They give lip service to the idea that they are saved by God's grace and they're living for Him. But if you listen to them talk for a while, you'll find out that really they're life is all about them, not at all about God. And I, I hesitate to say this, but I've talked to some people that would call themselves the ministry, and when you listen to them talk, their ministry is all about them and not at all about God. This is either all about God or it's not about anything. They didn't continue to build a religious organization. They continued to follow the will and the plan and the leading of God. That's where we continue. Now, in many cases, some people replace the good works that God asks us to do in His Word with good works that they choose because they feel comfortable doing those particular things. That's a bribe, folks. That's not a sacrifice that God requires. And furthermore, it doesn't work because God is no respecter of persons. You either do it His way or not at all. There's a lot of attempted appeasement going on in the Old Testament. If you read through the Old Testament, one preacher said uh, that 85% of the Old Testament is God saying, if you don't stop that, I'm going to kill you. And I'm not sure that's exactly true, but there's a lot of very terrified Israelites, very nervous priests, and a very uh, great amount of sacrificial animals being killed all the time. And they scurry around from slaughter to slaughter to slaughter to slaughter, and you still get the impression that God is still very frustrated because he'll speak through prophets like Isaiah in 1 and 10, and he'll say this. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah do not exist at that time. That's God saying to Israel, you're just like Sodom and you're just like Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear me, before me, who hath required this at your hands to tread my courts? God said, who told you to do this? And of course, in their mind, they're thinking, well, God, you told us to do this. This is what we know from the law of Moses. This is what we know from Leviticus. This is what we know from all of the feasts and the festivals and the prescriptions and the offerings. This is what we know. You told us to do this, but God says, you're missing the point. I, I don't need your sacrifices. I don't need a few more goats to add to the cattle on a thousand hills. I don't need bulls I don't need bullocks. I don't need uh, any of the animals you're bringing for sacrifice. I don't need that. The only reason there's so much blood and so much gore and so much sacrifice and, and so much disgusting ritual in the Old Testament that is repulsive to the modern mind, the only reason that's there is to show a people how repulsive sin is to God. It's not because God needs them to offer a sacrifice. It's because God wants to teach them that no matter how much you do and no matter how hard you work at it and no matter how good you get at it, you could never measure up to the glory of God that he's privileged his people to experience. So if you want to take it immediately, I know I'm talking to preachers and the problem with preachers in a sermon is they're way out a thousand miles in front of me right now. If you want to take this to the New Testament, let's go. 
When you get to the New Testament, God doesn't need this beautiful sanctuary. God doesn't need this incredible staff. God doesn't need that awesome anointed choir. God doesn't need all of us preachers. God doesn't need saints showing up on Wednesday or Sunday. God doesn't need your hand clap. God doesn't need you to lift up your arms. God doesn't need you to run across the front. God doesn't need you to lift up uh, some sacrifice to him. God blesses you by allowing you to come in to his presence and do any and all of the above. And when he touches down with his glory, that's not because we did it exactly right. That's not because we followed a specific formula that you can repeat next week. That's because out of a heart full of gratitude, we offered up something to God. I worry about me. I worry about the church that I'm privileged to serve as pastor. I worry about us sometimes, that we can go through our rituals and our routines, and instead of feeling the weight of the glory of God, and instead of feeling humbled in his presence, it's kind of like we're doing the routine thing that we do every week. We talk about it a lot, but we seldom feel it like we should. In the Old Testament... Instead of feeling the weight of walking into the tabernacle and looking around and saying, there's so much blood here. Smell the stench of those animals as they're killed and the blood is shed and the carcasses are burnt. Smell the stench of that. God must be horribly displeased with sin. We must be so far beneath his glory. We must be so far beneath his holiness that we have to do this over and over and over again. And God's problem with them through the prophet Isaiah, he says, instead of feeling the weight of your sin instead of learning that you need to do this from your heart and not just on a routine instead of that all you've done is said well I guess we need to go get another bull I guess I can go sin one more time and I can bring God another turtle dove I can bring God another lamb I can bring God another he goat and God says you have missed the point it's not more sacrifices that I want it's not more blood that I want Want spill. It's not more animals that I want sacrifice. That's just the object lesson so you'll figure out I want you. I want you to want me. I want you to desire my courts. I want you to desire my sanctuary and my presence. It's like a child abuser who would buy his little girl a doll and expect it to be okay or a A wife beater who walks in one day and passes his wife a bouquet of flowers or an adulterer who takes his wife on a cruise. That little girl doesn't want that doll. That wife doesn't want your flowers or your stupid cruise. She wants you to repent. She wants you to treat her with honor. God feels the same way, folks. God doesn't want our efforts as if our efforts in worship or church building or evangelizing or whatever it is that we're called and gifted to do. God doesn't want that so we somehow measure up to some standard that we've set or he's set. God wants us to be a people that long and love to be in his presence and everything grows out of that. God says, Who required this at your hand to tread my courts? Who told you to come in here? Israel's thinking, God, you told us. You could pull that into the New Testament and say, God, who? You know, God could say, well, who told you to raise your hands? And who told you to run? And who told you to leap? And we'd say, well, God, you said because it's in your word. But there's a very fine line there, ladies and gentlemen. If you do it just because it's Pentecostal culture, If we do it just because we know that's how we operate and we're kind of proud of our distinctives in worship or whatever, if we do it just for that reason, we've majorly missed the point. The point is not 
that we go out of the service having some kind of emotional fix met. The point is that we worship God. Will emotions get involved? You want to believe it? Thank God they do. But if you can worship God through your emotions, so to speak, and never really communicate with God, and we call it worship, God's wanting more than that. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 8, the Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, it was just a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. It stood only in meat and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinance, card carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation. That's Old Testament. That's Levitical priesthood. You come, you bring your offering, and you walk away thinking there, wow, that's over. God's pleased one more time. You come and you bring your sacrifice, and you walk away thinking, well, there, I did something good to appease and to balance and to offset the evil that I had done. That's kind of the Levitical system. We talk at, about it as though, well, they were pushing away uh, sins, pushing ahead sins one year at a time by doing all of that. You, you, can ex, uh, you can study that. You can expound on that. You can teach that. You can preach that. And, and we understand what we're saying. But really, the bigger point here is not that God was giving them some cover for their sin. So you just come keep paying me off. The Lord is no respecter of persons. You can't just buy God off and say, well, I had three really good days this week, but I did that one bad thing on Tuesday night or Wednesday afternoon, but I had the rest of the week was really good. And so I'm going to come into the presence of God, and I'll give God my little two-minute repentance and say, well, God, you know that I'm not perfect, and I'm only human and, and we do all of that and then we begin to worship God and all the time God's saying you're operating under the Levitical priesthood you're operating as though you lived in the Old Testament that you just come and bring me this offering and it's like you drop some money in the plate and you walk away with your conscience soothed God said that wasn't even what I had in mind for the Old Testament let alone the New Testament in the New Testament I'm not looking for a bribe I'm not looking for your best effort. I'm not looking for your perfect program. What I'm looking for is a people that are so hungry to be in my presence that prayer is no longer an effort and worship is no longer something that they endure to get through to the preaching so we can hear that, come to the altar, and go home. I'm looking for a people that literally their heart pants to be in my presence. It's astounding how many apostolics who the Bible calls you a royal priesthood. We're still living like we were Levitical priesthood. 1 Peter 2 verse 9. You were a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. you got to stop there at that verse because the point of that verse is the gratitude of being pulled out of darkness into light. The reason we do all of the above, the reason we are all of the above is one day God translated us us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Here's his point. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, I beg you, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Like I said, I'm usually coming at this from a different side of the coin, but please let me speak my heart today and pray that it is God's heart for this meeting and that I don't color it in any way. I want to live for God. I want to be a holy person. I want to abstain from fleshly lusts, not because it puts me in good standing with my pastor or my church or it keeps me out of scandal or it allows me to have some kind of uh, ministry. I don't want to live that way. If I'm a saint of God, I don't want to just keep away from sin because it keeps me out of pastor's office or it 
it lets me sing in the choir or it avoids tongues wagging about what I did in the church. I don't want to just stay far enough away from sin that I, uh, I'm hiding it from everybody else. I want to abstain from fleshly lusts for this reason. They war against my soul. Everything that's good in me, everything that is God in me, everything that is holy and growing in God in me. If I get into fleshly lust, they war against that and they tear it down. It is dysfunctional, folks. My dear brothers and sisters and my colleagues in ministry, it is dysfunctional to live a lifestyle of holiness because of what other people think instead of what God thinks. That is dysfunctional. We have to learn that we are not living holy because it is how we belong to the club. We have to learn that we are living holy because we are in love with God and God is holy. All of you married people, you know this. All of you single people that are in a relationship that's romantic, you know this. That you will do things and say things and be patient with things because you love that person and that's who they are or what they like. That's what God is. That's what God wants. God is not an inanimate power. He is not a dispassionate supernatural being. God is a person. He has likes and he has dislikes. He has a personality. He has a heart. And God wants us to be holy because he's holy and we want to have a relationship with him. Nothing more, nothing less. If we could ever get that one thing down, we wouldn't have a problem with all the trivia that we mess ourselves up with if we just had a spirit of holiness. You know this, there is a spirit of holiness. It's not a list of holiness. It's, it's not a bunch of rules of holiness. That's often how we feel forced to present it. Nothing could be further from the truth. If you get a spirit of holiness, the psalmist said in the Old Testament, your commandments are not grievous unto me. I love to do the commandments of God because I trust him that they're good for me. I trust him that they're best for me. But more than all of that, I do them because he is holy and so if I'm holy I get to have relationship with God and I want relationship with God so much that holiness is not burdensome to me. We, we, we've got to stop looking at the things that we do and the ways that we live as though it was some kind of cultural thing that God did in the New Testament church. God has always wanted a people that didn't approach him by just saying, well, God, here you go. Here's Sunday sacrifice, and here's Wednesday sacrifice, and here's my payback for what I did this week. God said, what are you doing just trampling my courts? It's dysfunctional to be more concerned about covering sin than dealing with sin. It's dysfunctional to be more concerned about a ministry image than a ministry reality. It's dysfunctional to continue just for the sake of continuing. We've got to continue the right way. Say to your neighbor, this will work for everyone, but it won't work for everyone. And Peter starts the ball rolling in the New Testament at the household of Cornelius. The Gentiles are finally being welcomed into the church. It's been God's will since Acts 2 and 39 to have the Gentiles in the church, but it's taken Peter and the rest of the apostles more than a decade to finally act on what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Because like some of us, Peter sometimes got anointed and said things he didn't even believe. And that's what he did on Pentecost. The promise is unto you, Jews, and your children, Jews. And then the Holy Ghost hit him, and it was all over for poor Peter. And all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And ten years later, Peter is walking in to the household of Cornelius, looking around and not even wanting to be there because this is a Gentile home. And in Acts 10, verse 34, then Peter opened his mouth and he looks around in awe at what God's doing. And he says, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation, in every person, he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. God is no respecter of persons. If it worked for the first century church, it'll still work in the 
21st century church if we continue. God is no respecter of persons. Paul voices this principle repeatedly. He says it about church leaders, Galatians 2. But of these who seem to be somewhat whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Paul said, they didn't impress me by their stature. They didn't impress me by their reputation because I know this principle. God accepteth no man's person person. He's not impressed by their reputation because he knows their reality. Paul says it to masters in Ephesians 6 and 9. Ye masters do the same things unto them, forbearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven. You better treat your servants right because God, neither is there respect of persons with him. He doesn't give you a break just because you're the master and they're the servant. No respect of persons. Persons. Paul says it to servants in Colossians 3. He that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. And then he just backs up and says it to all of us in Romans 2, verse 11. For there is no respect of persons with God. So Paul has just explained in several different con contexts why the, why the salvation that we have and the principles that we live by and the kingdom blessings we enjoy, they will work for everyone because God is no respecter of persons. We've developed this little uh, thing in the 21st century where we look around and we compare ourselves among ourselves and the Bible says that's not wise. There are many different ministries and many different giftings and many different functions in the great body of Christ and just because you perceive that someone else is being more favored by God or you perceive that someone is less than you or greater than you, that's all human garbage. That doesn't work with God. In the kingdom of God, there is no respect of persons. That's all through your Bible. John 3.16 says, whosoever believeth in him should not perish. So this is open to everybody. The Bible even concludes by reminding us of this principle. The spirit and the bride say come. Revelation 22. Let him that heareth say come and let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take the water of of life freely. But it is Peter who first cracked open this issue in the New Testament who writes near the, near the end of the New Testament and he explains this. This will work for everybody but it won't work for everybody. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 13 Wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children. Don't fashion yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he that which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That's lifestyle. Because... Simply because, not five reasons, not six rules, not 20 commandments, not 13 church policies. Simply because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without respect of persons, there it is, judges according to every man's work, if you pass the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as you know, this is why we do it, you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain lifestyle, your conversation, received by tradition from your fathers. This isn't just a religion. This isn't just a ritual. But you were saved. You were redeemed with the the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So let me be very clear here. All the preachers that tell us today that God doesn't care about our works, they're exactly wrong. The Bible contradicts them on numerous occasions. It is true that as a sinner, you couldn't do enough good works to get saved. That's absolutely true. But it's equally true that as a Christian, if you really are one, if you really do have a Holy Spirit in your heart, you do good works after you're saved, not to keep saved, not to merit salvation, not so God doesn't get mad and wipe you off the map. That's not why you 
you do it. Be ye holy, for I am holy. You do everything that you do to be in relationship with the one that you love. Without respect of persons simply means that God won't accept your excuses as to why you didn't live according to his word. That's what without respect of persons means. We're all held to the same standard. We're all held to the same principles. No great eyes, no big eyes, little U's. It's everyone on the same tier in the kingdom of God. This will work for everyone. But it won't work for everyone. <laughs> because God is no respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of principles. And if you obey his word, his word works. But if you just hang around with people that are obeying his word, it doesn't work. If you just go to a church where the preacher believes in revival, you can go there for 50 years and you can never experience revival yourself. God is a respecter, not of people, but he is a respecter of his principles. But more than that, we learn from the Old Testament and we learn from the New Testament that God is a respecter of passion. God is a respecter of people who are totally sold out, hardcore, no holds barred, insanely apostolic in serving him. They always get God's attention. You can see this in the Gospels before we even get to the book of Acts. The four friends of the paralyzed man tearing a roof apart in Mark chapter 2 because of their passion. Their friend gets his healing. The woman with the issue of blood crawling through a crowd on her hands and knees and her belly. She gets her healing in Mark 5 because of her passion. The mother wanting a crumb for her daughter with a demon in Mark chapter 7 and Jesus calls her a daughter and says, you know, the dogs don't deserve, uh, the, you, these are the children's, uh, this is the children's bread. And she said, the dogs, master, they get to eat of the crumbs that fall from the table. So Jesus, I'm not asking for all the bread that you'd give your children, but if you'd just give me a crumb, I can take that crumb and that crumb will bless my life. That crumb is enough to get my healing. If I can just get a little crumb, your kids will drop enough on the floor by the time they're finished with their meal, that I can just grab that little crumb. You read about the father who battles his own unbelief in Mark 9. I believe, but Jesus helped my unbelief. And his passion, because of that, his son gets his healing. You see it in blind Bartimaeus crying out over the opposition of the crowd in Mark chapter 10. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, thou son of David. And they're always trying to settle him down. And we preach that uh, about worship. You know, we don't want to settle down worship, but really there's something that comes behind and beneath worship, and that is the passion of that man for what he needs from Jesus. And there's something that drives our praise and our worship. There's something that drives our preaching and our church building. There's something that drives our evangelism and our outreaches. There's something that drives our holiness and our lifestyle. And what it is, is not Levitical priesthood. It's not just coming and bringing God an offering and walking away unchanged. It's not just coming and paying off the great King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You couldn't give him anything that he needs and really you can't give him anything that he desires. What he desires is the one that he created and that's you that's what he desires God doesn't respect your person you can have a pedigree in Pentecost that is four generations long and three miles wide, but God doesn't respect that. But he does respect his principles, and he does respect your passion toward his principles. And it has always been so. And they continued. I've been teaching through the book of Acts for several weeks in our church. If I don't get out of the first few chapters before too long, it's going to be like a three-year series. It, it's, we've been going through the book of Acts, and the book of Acts is an incredible book. The book of Acts is our blueprint. The book of Acts is, is what we need to follow if we're going to build a church. I love new uh, ideas, and I love methods, and I love strategizing, and I love all of that. But the more I've looked at that, and the more we've tried some of that, we keep coming back to the fact that although we can do some of those things fairly well, maybe not as well as you, maybe in some cases better than you, I don't know, and it's really not important. Because when we get to the end of the day, strategy 
strategies and methods and all of that. They're just so much bringing our program to God and asking God to show up. And really, God doesn't show up on your schedule or your program. He doesn't show up because you walked into church with the sacrifice that you chose to bring and you dump it at the altar in a five-minute prayer and you walk out. That's Levitical priesthood. You're not Levitical priesthood. You are a royal priesthood. You are a chosen generation. You're a peculiar people. And so we're not governed by just a little ritual where we bring what we desire to give to God and we get him to put his little blessing and give us a little hand clap. That's not how we're governed. When you see us worship, our worship is not supposed to be cultural. It's not supposed to be. It's influenced by culture, but it's not supposed to be cultural. Our worship is not supposed to be just emotional. Our worship is an expression of a passion for the kingdom of God to come and the will of God to be done. It's got very little to do with whether you feel emotionally on top or emotionally on the bottom. It's got very little to do with whether you're leading or whether you're sitting in the pew. It's got very little to do with whether they asked you your opinion about the contents of the service or not. It's got nothing to do with that. That's Levitical priesthood. Let's put our program together. Let's bring God what he requires. I don't want to just bring God what he requires. I want to bring God something with my life and with my worship. And if I've got a ministry with my ministry, I want to bring God something that he said, that kid doesn't have too many clues, but that kid loves me. That kid may not always get it right, but he loves me. That kid may not always do the right thing for the right reason, but when he falls, he comes running to me because he loves me. I love God to show up just because he enjoys being near all the stuff that we do. I wish you'd lift your hands and do more than lift your hands. I wish you'd open your mouth and do more than open your mouth. I wish you'd craft some words worthy of the God that you serve. I worship you, Jesus. One more time, would you just lift up your hands in the presence of the Lord? Mm. Habakkuk the prophet spoke in 3 and 2 and said, O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years make known. In wrath remember mercy. We're praying that over our church, which is a little past 50 years old. I tell them all the time, I know how stubborn 50-year-old things can be, because I am one. Revive your work in the midst of the years, in the middle of our history, in the middle of our programs, in the middle of what we are doing, in the middle of our activity. Revive your work in the midst of the years. The book of Acts is an unbelievable book. I had to ask God to forgive me for just studying it for kind of doctrinal content. You know, the book of Acts, it starts out not with doctrine. It starts out with experience. And then doctrine grows out of that experience. I'm not suggesting for a minute that we need to change doctrine 
because of every experience that floats by. I'm saying that the original New Testament church, they had an experience that was so strong with God that they spent the rest of their lives defining and, 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 and talking about and teaching about and preaching about that initial experience that lit them on fire. And I fear that we sometimes get it backwards. I know that I do. That we go from a doctrinal position and we say we have this set of beliefs. I'm not looking to change them. I told you, I, I normally come from the other side of the coin. This, this, is not, uh, this is not my typical address. But we normally come from a doctrinal standpoint. And then we want that experience to show up because we are preaching the right doctrine. The right doctrine is critical. It's foundational. You can't change it. Signs follow them that believe. Signs don't just follow those that quote other people that believe the right doctrine. Signs follow those that believe. We need not only right doctrine, because they had the right doctrines of the Old Testament in Israel, what they didn't have was an understanding of the love of God that was behind everything that they did. The temple, they came, and it was the love and the mercy of God that allowed them, sinners before a holy God, to walk in sinful and to walk out with an animal laying dead on the table, uh, its blood dripping down into a basin. They walk out, and they get to walk out, and the sin of that man has been transferred onto the head of that lamb, and he walks out free, and he takes the life that that animal gave, and the animal takes the death that he deserves, and he walks out free. And Israel did that 10,000 times 10,000 times and they never ever understood what God was really trying to teach them the reason we live holy is not so we keep the pastor off our back the reason we do ministry is not so we can build our portfolio and we can uh, see great things and this ministry leads to that ministry leads to that ministry leads to that ministry the reason we do everything we do ladies and gentlemen is because God has privileged us to be his chosen people, his royal priesthood. In Acts chapter 28, there's a scripture that I love. It's the very last couple of verses of the book of Acts. A couple of years back, I was privileged to preach a funeral for a precious missionary lady, Sister Margaret Shaum. She had traveled the world. She was a great lady. Her happiest years were spent in missions. And uh, Sister Shaum, at the end of her life, was confined to a little hospital bed in her little apartment, this lady that had traveled the world. And as her world grew smaller, Jesus grew bigger in her. I don't even know how to describe it other than that. Her prayer life and her worship and everything just grew so powerful and so precious to God. And I see that so many times in God's people. I see that in chapter 28 of the book of Acts, verse 30 and 31. Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house. He received all that came in unto him. He preached the kingdom of God. He taught those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. By the end of the book of Acts, Paul is forcibly confined to his lodgings. Nero's in power, and his brothers and sisters are dying in all kinds of arenas all throughout the Roman Empire, and Paul is confined to a house. He is bound. He can't go out. He only can receive those that come in. And in that situation, Luke writes about Paul, Paul preached and he taught everybody that came in. He did all of that with all confidence, no man forbidding him. And the last words in Acts chapter 28, no man forbidding him, are four words in English, and they are one word in the Greek language, akolutos, which means unhindered or unpreventable or even unstoppable. And Luke writes that Paul 
although he's no longer traveling the globe, although he's no longer preaching to great crowds, although he's no longer being sought out by the masses, although Paul is no longer going from city to city, starting churches, and his sphere of influence seems to be very limited. Luke stops the book of Acts on a dime, and he says Paul was unstoppable. Paul couldn't be hindered. He couldn't be stopped. He couldn't be fought against, even though it looked like everything was going backwards. Because you know what Paul was doing? He was continuing what he had started in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is not just about continuing a doctrine. It's about continuing a pattern. The book of Acts is not just about continuing a heritage. It's about continuing a mindset. The disciples spent all of their lives and all of their ministries constantly trying to tell people, this is what we experience. This is what Jesus said. This is what Jesus Jesus told us to preach, and they just continued that. It doesn't seem very glamorous. It doesn't seem very dramatic, and it certainly doesn't seem to fit with the 21st century that changes methods and plans, programs, doctrines, and beliefs about every three weeks. But there's something about this continuance of the book of Acts that even though the book of Acts looks like it ends on a point of defeat, by the time we get to the 21st century, what looked like it shouldn't have survived the first century is now in hundreds of communities, in dozens and dozens of nations, and we've got brothers and sisters believing this. That's not because they had overwhelming success in a worldly venue. That's because they continued. That's because they continued. Would you take the hand of the person standing or sitting next to you right now and just lift it with your hand? I'm finished. We'll get the music to come back. But I'd like you to lift that hand with yours, and I'd like you to pray for them just one thing, that they would continue, that they would continue, that they would continue. Thank you for your attention today. You're not continuing just because you're Pentecostal. You're not continuing just because you're a member of this church or any other church. You're not continuing just because you're part of this ministerial body and this is what we preach or believe. You're continuing because this is what Jesus left us. And we love Jesus. I get that so complicated sometimes. But that's why... I do what I do, and you do what you do. That's why. It's easier to preach than to pray. It's easier to live publicly than privately. It's easier to do many cultural things in Pentecost than it is to really grapple with the fact that this isn't just a lifestyle we live. This is a heavenly lover that we have. I told you I'm usually on the other side of the coin totally on this one. I love the power that is in what we teach and preach. But the power that is in what we teach and preach, I don't want to use it. I want it to use me. Does that make sense? I, I don't want to use it. I want it to use me. There are some incredible, magnificent ministries in this room. Hundreds of years of experience in the kingdom of God. Great men and women of God. But we don't stand before God as the United Pentecostal Church. And we don't stand before God as a ministerial body. And we don't stand before God with our local church. 
we stand before God with whatever we have, whatever we don't have, and he evaluates it on one criteria, whether that motive was out of love for him or whether it got mixed in with a whole lot of human ego and human pride, believe in our reputation and our press releases and instead of just being a man or woman after his heart. I'm sorry, I should have a better conclusion. <laughs> but I feel the Holy Ghost here this afternoon. We say that he is here. We say that he really is here. Like the woman with the alabaster box, I wish you would just start to pour your love out on God for a couple of minutes. And we'll go our separate ways for a few hours and we'll be back for a great service. But I wish you'd take a moment in the middle of this conference and you would pour your love out on Jesus right now. Not because you're a minister and you're leading a service, not because you're a saint singing in the choir or singing a solo, but I wish you'd get just a glimpse of the fact that you're a royal priesthood. You just need to wait for this. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to take any more time. We just need to wait for this for a moment. I worship you, Jesus. Sore rabo koye mende sho sabate la basa. Would you lift up your hands as you're praying? Can you lift up your hands and realize that it's not just a physical action? You're pouring out your praise on the one, the one. La rota la casio sama sta sopra. Se sto che sta 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 sopra. So ste so sama sta sopra sta sopra. Preachers and saints of God, would you stand to your feet right now? And would you lift up your voice? Would you lift up your voice? Not Pentecostal tradition, that's not what I'm talking about. Would you lift up your voice? Not doing a semi-conscious talking in tongues, but lift up your voice and pour out your praise. Jesus' name. Jesus name Jesus In Jude, we find him writing in verse 3, I wanted to write of our common salvation. But he said, I realized it was necessary for me to write to you of the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's very specific in Greek. It was delivered once for all. We do not have an evolving gospel that needs to be updated with the latest theories of psychology and sociology and legality. But we have the faith which once for all was delivered to the saints. It saved people in the first century. It saves people in the 21st century.